This episode is sponsored by the Women's History Initiative at the Utah Historical Society, seeking to amplify women's stories and deepen our collective understanding of the many roles women play in history. This episode is also brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Molly Moss, Tony Cornish, Deb Potter, Skylar Collins, Julie Gray, Bree Ames Smith, Robin Brown, Janelise Cannon, Kim Hokinson, Jamie Lang, Maria Carlos Sanchez, Valerie Jacobson, Jill Harrigan, Heather McKinnon, Chantel Oliver, Lindsay Cummings, and Eugene Lewis. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and help us create new episodes of the podcast. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. Hey, I don't remember you being a tenor. (laughs) Hello, I have bronchitis. (laughs) Happy holidays. (laughs) The beautiful gift your children gave to you. (laughs) And yet here you are powering through to bring this story to the masses. I'm here for it. And people have stated before how it's hard to tell us apart, but I bet people have no problem telling us apart this time. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this courageous action in difficult times is a good meta lesson about the woman that we're going to be talking about today. Oh, great. I'm glad we can call this courage. Yes. (laughs) Why? Who are we talking about? It's 1937. Okay. In China, a young American woman is currently smuggling herself across enemy lines in an active war. Um, 37. Yeah, not a great time Uh -uh. to be in China at all or an American in China. Yeah. And this young woman has decided that she must interview this weird young guy who started making waves in China, but nobody knows what his deal is. And she thinks somebody really should actually go talk to him and find out what he's doing. Okay. This little known dude's name is Mao Zedong. (laughs) No way. And he has recently started this new political movement in China. (laughs) As a reaction to the catastrophic failures of the people currently in charge. Yeah. Wow. And Helen Foster Snow has a feeling that something might be going on there. Wow. And the world should probably meet this guy. Now, Helen Foster Snow had arrived in Shanghai, a 23-year-old college dropout in hopes of gaining enough life experience to write the great American novel. Wow. And along the way accidentally became one of the most famous women in China, who is almost entirely unknown in the United States. How she got in the room with Mao Zedong is a whole story that we will get to. But how she got to China at all Hmm. is a pretty wild ride. So let's dive right in. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating Women You've Never Heard Of. To introduce us to Helen Foster Snow, I called up an old friend by the name of Adam Foster. Hmm. You may remember my high school friend, Adam Foster. Didn't you guys star in Into the Woods together? We did. Were you, was he the baker? And you were the baker's wife? Baker and the baker's Uh, wife. Cool. And though I had no idea of this fact until a couple of years ago, he is also the great nephew of Helen Foster Snow, who I've been obsessed with since moving back from China and discovering she existed. Cool. And did not realize, oh, hey, I'm real good friends with her nephew that I could just talk to. Adam Foster is also the founder of the Helen Foster Snow Foundation. Cool. My name is Adam Foster. I'm the chairman of the Helen Foster Snow Foundation, located in Lehigh, Utah. Our mission is to preserve, promote, and continue Helen's legacy of building bridges of international understanding. We have lots of programs and exciting activities we do in China and the U.S. to help promote people-to-people exchange, which I think is the heart of international relations. And I am a childhood friend of Olivia. When I was a kid, 
We heard stories about Aunt Helen and all her adventures in China. But really, we had no idea the kind of impact she had. Helen Foster was born in Cedar City, Utah. Not exactly a bustling metropolis. Not exactly. Ever since she read The Wizard of Oz as an eight-year-old girl, she had dreamed of becoming the next great American novelist. And she felt really strongly that she did not have enough life experience to write anything important. Wow. So she needed to get out in the world. Well, I mean, she probably was not wrong. No, That's yeah, awesome. I, she, she certainly gained life experience. She passed the foreign service exam, which is not a simple thing to do. And with a recommendation letter in hand from Utah Senator Reed Smoot, <laughs> Helen boarded the SS President Lincoln to accept a clerkship in the U.S. consulate in Shanghai, China. Cool. She had originally aimed for Europe, but <laughs> there were no jobs available, and so she settled for China. <laughs> she was setting off for a one-year adventure, but in that fateful moment, the rest of her life was waiting on the other side of the door. <laughs> Why did I tell you I was going to Shanghai? I want to be with you tonight. Why did I holler I was going to Shanghai? I want to be with you tonight. It was just a little misunderstanding. That I, I'm just so fascinated about how in the world did she get away with this? Like, as a Utah Mormon woman in the 20s, you don't go to China and be a journalist. And everyone goes, cool, 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 cool. So were, were, was your family like horrified or were they cheering her on? How did she make this happen? Yeah, I think it's unique because my great grandmother, Hannah Davis, who was a very unique woman. She was a professor. She built her own house. She represented Utah on the suffrage float at the Chicago parade in the 19, well, it was like 1914 or something like that. She was very independent. And so she instilled in Helen this unique sense of purpose and that she could do anything, anything she wanted. And when she was a kid, she gave her her camera and she said, I want you to interview your relatives. And so I think she got her love of writing and journalism from her mother. She wanted to travel the world. And her dad was the Iron County prosecutor. He was a lawyer. And so he instilled in her a sense of justice and I think a sense of being able to look at a situation and analyzing it from an objective point of view. So you see both sides of the argument. And that's when she was in China, that's what she did. And so when she became a war correspondent, her family was just really proud of what she was able to do. She arrived in China in 1931. And I, I think it's important here to kind of give a very short explainer of what China in 1931 is. Mm. Because the amount of change that has happened in two decades, it, it, it is an entirely different mm -hmm. world. We are 20 years out from the end of the Qing dynasty mm -hmm. here, from what you kind of think of as peak medieval yeah. fashion. Forbidden city still being closed off to all outsiders and yeah, co just like absolute and warlords. Yeah, yeah. And it's so shocking to me how close together those things are. And it's just like, how did we go from like Dragon Lady metal fingernails <laughs> to our grandma singing in a nightclub in Shanghai? Like, how are those things in close proximity? China is also right in the middle of a major refugee crisis, major environmental disasters, right. starvation is rampant, political instability on a level that's hard to understand. Yeah. So super quick distillation of an incredibly complicated 50-year period of Chinese history here. Japan has been operating a semi-puppet government, but things are heating up yeah. really quickly with Japan. 
In the 1930s, China is fighting a war against Japan and tearing itself apart between these two visions of the future. The nationalists, a.k.a. the Kuomintang, a.k.a. official government, is led by Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek. And then this new Chinese Communist Party under Mao Zedong. But China has been fighting for its identity and its autonomy since the 19th century. And now in the 30s, both sides are calling for a return to a strong, unified China. They just differ in pretty much every detail on how to make that happen. And this is the chaotic mess that she is jumping into. Yeah, interesting. She is officially a clerk with the Foreign Service, but what she really wants to do is become a writer. Maybe she can start writing about what she sees in China and send those somewhere and give herself a reputation along with the life experience and the writing practice. Yeah. I mean, we're not far out from the great era of the girl stunt reporters. And she is nothing if not intrepid. She will launch herself into situations that make my eyebrows raise through mm. my hairline. Mm. And she seems completely unfazed mm. by them. I like her already. And pretty quickly after she arrives, the Yangtze River floods catastrophically. A horrific natural disaster will eventually kill somewhere between 600,000 to possibly as many as 2 million people. Jeez. This flood inundates 69,000 square miles. Mm. That is England mm. and half of Scotland is underwater. Oh, as if China didn't have enough going on at the time. Yes, and as wow. things were already exciting, and now this. <laughs> and she is right there in the middle of it. She is able to give on-the-ground first-hand reports. Another major event that happens very quickly after her arrival is a chance meeting with a journalist who has already been there several years named Edgar Snow. Snow. Edgar is also an American. He has decided he's leaving. He's done. He's very sick. He has caught malaria. He is just really struggling. Edgar has a chapter in his famous book, Red Star Over China, called Death and Taxes. I cried when I read it. He was describing the famine that happened and how there were granaries full of grain. And these landlords were letting the villagers just starve to death. It, it broke him. It really broke him. He was ready to give up. I'm going home. But in a coffee shop, he runs into this young woman who has just arrived and is, by all accounts, absolutely enchanted by her. At first sight, he's stumbling over things on his way to sit down next to her, mm. like Hallmark movie style. When Helen walked through that door at the cafe, he said it was like a, a breeze just coming through. They are both fascinated with writing, with China, with people, and he decides to stick around a bit longer. They become quickly inseparable, and they marry on Christmas Day, 1932. And they will remain in China for another 10 years. Oh, wow. Together, they become a powerhouse of journalism. They are well known together as the voice of China to the West. Hmm. These two are the main English language journalists and writers explaining China to the world, giving those humanizing insights, the on the ground, real world, not the political show, not the war, not the government, the people. What are the people of China like? And it is Edgar and Helen Foster Snow who do that work for the next 10 years. She takes a pen name, Nim Wales. 
she needs a pseudonym. Get it? Nim. <laughs> Edgar already has a price on his head from the Japanese government. So he was hoping to protect her from being associated with him. And that worked for a while. But, of course, eventually people figure out who she is. And by the end of their time in China, they both have assassins hunting for them. Gosh. But they are both determined to get the truth out no matter what the cost. There are so many lives at stake and so many massive international consequences if the prevailing false nationalist and Japanese propaganda is allowed to continue to be the only voice coming out of China. She is there for almost every major event of the 1930s. Dang. Helen is writing for Time Magazine, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Saturday Evening Post, the Boston Herald, the New York Tribune, Reader's Digest. I mean, all of the main English language publications at this point are featuring her work and her insights into what is going on here. It's unique because her books are written from an American perspective, talking about what's going on in China. If I were to read a book about China written by a Chinese person, it would be different. But because I'm an American, I can connect with her way of explaining yeah. things. And that really helps. She's using her mother's Kodak camera to capture this activist movement, this pushback, as well as the lives of the refugees who have been flooding into everywhere from the Japanese attacks, from the student uprisings, from the flood. She took over 5,000 photographs that are now housed at Brigham Young University. And when the Chinese people want to learn about their history, they come to Utah. She is there for the uprisings against the government that is completely failing to mm -hmm. cope with Japanese aggression, with starvation, with the floods, mm -hmm. with mass death mm -hmm. from a variety of causes. So much internal corruption. Yeah, a completely incompetent... A broken system, and yeah. She is there for the 1936 coup against the nationalist leader of the country. Jeez, that's crazy. She had this just innate ability to just some of the things she writes, you know, at 80 years before I was there. But I still recognize instantly like, oh, yes, <laughs> she's captured that thing about the experience of being in this specific location or that thing about the way China is that that it's still true, apparently, 80 years later. And that she she caught that spark of the, the thing that made me fall in love with the country while being very aware of all of the problems, right? <laughs> she had this really unique ability to see the goodness through the horrors. It's a gift to be able to do that and then to be able to write it in a, such a way that you can pass that on to someone else. That's, that's kind of miraculous. This season of What's Her Name is sponsored by the Women's History Initiative at the Utah Historical Society. Think you know Utah history? Think again. The Women's History Initiative highlights Utah's dynamic history makers. Eight sovereign nations in Utah since time immemorial, pioneers, explorers, immigrants, entrepreneurs, visionaries, and dreamers who have made a home there ever since. Join the Society to read the Utah Historical Quarterly, attend free virtual events, and get news about the future Museum of Utah. Visit history.utah.gov slash UWH to learn more. And the long-awaited statue of what's-her-name favorite Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon will be installed in the National Statuary Hall collection at the U.S. Capitol within the next few months. Just the 13th woman featured in the hall. Follow at Utah State History on Instagram to catch Martha on the move as she makes her journey to D.C. And teachers at all levels can find all kinds of curriculum resources on their website, history.utah.gov slash UWH. They're getting a lot of great material in Shanghai, but Edgar is offered a job teaching journalism at a university in Beijing. Huh. 
So they moved to Beijing. He is teaching there and she is attending classes and becoming very close with the student activists there who are pushing hard against the government of Chiang Kai-shek and what they see as these huge amounts of corruption and incompetence. Wow. And because at this point in China, the legal system is still separate. Mm. Foreigners do not have to comply with Chinese law. Oh. They are able to help these student activists and get the word out on things in ways that that none of the Chinese citizens can do. Isn't Beijing very close to the Japanese-occupied Manchuria at this yes, time? Yes, it like, is. Very it close. It is right in their pocket. Oh, my gosh. So they're funneling information to the students because the government is censoring any kind of information from outside. And they're also helping distribute information inside the country, right? Helping these student activists hand out flyers and information. But also, they are really the only people getting the information out of the country about what's really going on, what is really happening in China, mm -hmm. as opposed to the official narrative mm -hmm. of what is happening, which are two very different things. Mm -hmm. She remarked that most of her friends there would have been executed for even thinking about doing most of the things she was doing. But because she has that protection of the American passport, she can do it. Wow. But no foreign journalist or foreigner of any kind, actually, has ever actually gotten this Mao guy on the record about what this new communist movement is, what their goals are, what they stand for, where they come from. Although Edgar has actually spent the whole previous year trying and failing to get Mao to talk to him about that. Hmm. Helen finally decides someone really needs to go to Yan'an and see what he's actually all about. So she just does it. <laughs> this meeting is the first time in history that Mao explained the history and goal of the Red Army to a foreigner. Oh and she gosh. just makes it happen. I'll tell you the stories that have made an impact on me. Number one, she's going to go to Yan'an. She shows up at the hotel, and there's two guards that are placed at her door so that she can't escape during the night. And then they put two guards at the front of the hotel because they know that who she is. Well, her plan was to meet someone who she hadn't ever met before to take her across the enemy lines, like in the middle of the night. And the signal was someone was going to leave a burning cigarette in the wall around the hotel. And that would be the sign that it was safe. Well, it was midnight. She can't leave the hotel room. She's trying to decide what to do. And she goes over her window and sees this giant pile of dirt. She's like, well, I could climb over that and hop over the wall and hopefully not break my leg. So she jumps out of her window. So now she's <laughs> in the street. She realizes, oh, crap. I'm out, but I don't know who I'm meeting. And we were supposed to meet there and we can't. <laughs> and so she's like, okay, I'm going to put on my actress hat. So she goes in front of the hotel and acts like this frantic traveler who's just trying to get out of here. I just want to leave Xi'an. I need to get back to Beijing. I need to get out of here. Just puts on this whole act of like the angry foreign Karen, basically, and is like yelling and doing this big, huge thing. <laughs> the two guards don't recognize her and they let her go. <laughs> she's walking in the streets and there's a curfew in place, right? No one's supposed to be out. So she's just kind of walking along the street Oh, no, I didn't think this through. Clearly he didn't come. And now they're going to find me not in my room in the morning and I'm going to be in so much trouble. And she sees this rickshaw going by. And he stops and she stops. And he's like, Helen, I was the guy that was supposed to put the cigarette in the wall, but there's too many guards. <laughs> and she just randomly runs into him and they sneak her across. 
And that's how she got to Yunnan. Wow. If she wanted to do something, she was going to find a way to make it happen, even if it means sneaking out of hotel rooms in the middle of the night in the middle of a war zone. Wow. And this becomes incredibly controversial. Later, that really blows back on her. She wrote nice Mm -hmm. things praising Chairman Mao well before he's Chairman Mao. Uh. But everything she said was true. She was neutral, politically neutral. She was telling the truth about what was going on. Yeah. About Mao and the Red Army and their plans and how they are treating the people in the places where they take over and their effectiveness Mm. at Mm -hmm. keeping people alive and dealing with natural disasters and... You don't know. Nobody knows how it's going to end. But at that point... They are the best option by far. by far. Especially just the way that they actually walked the walk of gender equality at the time. Mm -hmm. Like, nobody else is doing that. If if you were a woman and you wanted to be treated like a human, then mm-hmm. that was going to be the obvious path. It, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. <laughs> and her priority is always the human beings involved. Lessening the suffering of human beings. If it's a choice between helping an individual, even at the cost of her own journalistic mission, or her own safety, she would always do that even on the verge of the biggest scoops of her entire career at the moment she is being smuggled into Yan'an to interview Mao Zedong and while she's in this incredibly vulnerable and dangerous position being somewhere where she has absolutely no right to be and she will likely be killed outright if she is found there by the nationalists or by the Japanese She still cannot help but help. She sees these little kids, little children soldiers, and that there is an eye disease that was going around and it would make your eyes kind of puffy and gross and you couldn't see very well. And this little boy, maybe nine years old, comes up to her in the middle of the night. This kid has got this disease in his eyes. Well, she had brought with her a bottle of silver nitrate, which is what you're supposed to cure that in case it happens. And so she pours some of these drops into this kid's eyes and he just starts screaming. I mean, he is screaming bloody murder. It's painful. And he's like, what have you done to me? And she's like, I'm so sorry. And she stays up with him all night, comforting this little boy. And finally in the morning, his eyes are cleared up. She writes in her journal, and she's like, I am never helping anyone ever again. (laughs) Spoilers! She does help people again. Quite a lot, actually. And that's just who she was. She was a journalist. She wanted to get the story. Her career was important to her. But she could not help herself when she saw human suffering. She had to stop they start producing a magazine called Democracy. In what is somewhat a pattern in this marriage, Edgar Snow's name is on the magazine as an editor, but they have both agreed because he is writing a book that Helen will do all the work, (laughs) but Edgar's name will go on it. Mm -hmm. I have feelings about that. (laughs) And then in 1937, the Japanese launched another invasion. Mm -hmm. Japan now controls 90% of the country's industry. And the Chinese people are starving. And that's a feature, not a bug, right? This is part of Japan's plan here, is to leave absolutely no way for Chinese peasants to feed themselves. And so, together with Edgar and with Two of their friends, Rui Ali and Ida Pruitt, Helen Foster Snow establishes the Chinese Industrial Cooperative Association, otherwise known as Indusco, more colloquially known as the Gung Ho Movement. (laughs) Gung Ho, the phrase, which we know now means, right, enthusiasm, 
It's a kind of a conglomeration of several Chinese words meaning cooperation and hard work. And this is a movement to create small work co-ops for refugees, other people who are dislocated or impoverished by the war. They've had their factory seized. They've had their land seized by the Japanese government. So these people are going to come together in small little co-ops to feed each other, to take care of each other. Over 300,000 people across China end up working in these little co-ops. The work she did with the Gung Ho movement is just so powerful. Helping refugees, loaning them money to, to start small businesses and start little co-ops was able to help thousands of people. The Gung Ho movement was one of the only things that the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party could agree on. Mm. And so she brought those two sides together because they all could agree that refugees needed to eat and to survive. It's one of the most successful humanitarian movements, human rights movements, and sort of subversive economic movements in Eastern history. She wrote a book on Indusgove called China Builds for Democracy, and it created so much support for these co-ops in the United States that huge amounts of funding started pouring in. It's almost sort of a precursor of the microloan idea. Yeah, that's what idea, I was just thinking. We can give $20 yeah. to this Chinese village and we can keep 400 people alive. Yeah, wow. In fact, first prime minister of India, uh, Minister Nehru, he actually read her book. He implemented her ideas in India. And there were over 50,000 cooperatives in India because of what she did. Wow. It's just fantastic, just this bridge that she's built. And learning these stories and, and her bravery and how much courage she has, it's inspiring for me. And I hope my, my kids learn from this and from her example and that they want to make a difference in the world. Things in Beijing are getting a little dicey. Helen and Edgar return to Shanghai, but the infamously horrific Japanese invasion of southern China has happened, and they are now living in a city occupied by a foreign enemy. She manages to write her most famous book, Inside Red China, which became seen by historians as the most important and most meticulous eyewitness narrative to China in the 1930s. Her books, her articles, her work is the OG source material for most of what Western history does about this period in China for the next 30 or 40 years. Wow. By 38, the situation had become clearly impossible. They're in a war zone and the danger of being made prisoners of war by Japan yeah. is really high. Yeah. They first fled to Hong Kong, and then that became clear that wasn't going to be far enough. They go to the Philippines, where they live for two years, working on Indusco and Chinese human rights. And then... And then Japan comes for the Philippines. Whoa. They get out kind of by the skin of their teeth, return to California. Edgar is sent off as a war correspondent to Europe. And Helen is pretty happy to let him go at this point because the marriage has been falling apart for a while. Other people who knew them at the time pointed out that he often failed to give his wife credit when she was due it. <laughs> Edgar is an amazing journalist, and his most famous book was called Red Star Over China. Helen edited that book and wrote at least part of it for sure. Almost all the photos were taken by her. She risked her life to get the photos in the manuscript out of Xi'an during a war. And she got no credit for any of that. Wow. So she moved to Connecticut, and they divorced shortly after the end of World War II. Hmm. Helen was a journalist. She was a humanitarian. But in her view, her most important job was building bridges. Building bridges between cultures, between peoples, helping different people see that they were not that different. And the way that we are seeing each other as countries is not mm. conducive to understanding. 
We need and she more spends her bridge whole builders. life on that project. Absolutely. Although she's almost unknown in the U.S., she was recognized for that internationally. In fact, she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize twice. What? For her work oh to gosh. humanize and, in her words, provide the possibility of peace and understanding. Wow. And then McCarthyism arrives. Uh-oh. And anyone who has oh. said nice things about communists Uh-oh. is automatically suspect. And she's pretty much blackballed Whoa. for decades. When I was a kid, we heard stories about Aunt Helen in China. But really, we had no idea the kind of impact she had because she was a recluse during the 50s and 60s and 70s, she just kind of went into hiding. Anyone who was associated with China was under suspicion. The McCarthyism that was going on at the time, you know, that's just unfortunate. And it's funny because she, Helen was never a communist. In fact, she was very anti-political. If anything, she was more of a humanitarian. And then when China finally opens up again, Helen returns. Oh, wow. She makes her first visit in 1972. And then in 1978, she makes an official visit with the film crew and has an officially assigned translator, a young man who had majored in English literature in college, had been prevented from graduating just weeks before he was supposed to finish college by the launch of Mao's Cultural Revolution. He is thrilled to be asked to translate for Helen. Because even though her reputation has been dimmed quite a bit over these 30 years of perpetual war and anti-Western propaganda, this young man is very aware of who Helen is. In fact, he is fanboying hard. And I am perhaps equally thrilled to announce that a few weeks ago, Adam Foster introduced me to that young student translator, now a professor, and not perhaps quite so young, Professor Anway. His life story absolutely could be a book. And it is, actually. A book called One in a Billion. Interesting. Which everyone should read. The scope of change that Anway has lived through and the bridges that he has been able to help build within China and between China and the rest of the world is absolutely mind-blowing. And it... It's such a privilege to be able to get his insights into Helen Foster Snow's life and priorities and the way she saw the world. Because for the last 20 years of her life, they were the closest of friends. Anwe had initially been impressed by something he noticed during another important foreigner's visit. When Edgar Snow toured China in 1970, he made a pretty big impression on many English-speaking Chinese people by what he did not say. This famed and obviously officially respected foreigner did not publicly praise Mao. I saw him in 1970. He did not say anything good about the Cultural Revolution. Did not say a lot of good words about Mao Zedong. <laughs> so I get very interested in those days, the whole country uh, always yeah, recite Mao's quotations and always keep saying, long live Chairman Mao. <laughs> but he did not do so. So I, I thought it is very interesting. At a time when Mao was quite literally the be-all and end-all of Chinese public speech or thought or existence, like, they had literally renamed all of the streets in the country. Things like Mao is Great Boulevard and Hooray for Mao Lane. This absence of praise screamed like a fire alarm. This really stuck with Anwe. And a year after Edgar's visit, Anwe was sent on an assignment to a museum in Yan'an, where Helen first interviewed Mao back in 1937 to create signage on the museum's artifacts for the benefit of all these distinguished foreign visitors who keep visiting. They need someone to write about the stories behind those objects. 
I said, well, I'm not majored in history. I majored in English literature. But the Cutter School leader said, well, we check your record and uh, we found that you can write. So off he went to work at the museum, writing informational placards. When I go to the museum, we have a radio room. It's a small radio room, one room, and uh, there are all kinds of newspapers published in 1930s and 40s. And also many other books in which I found the Snow and Nemo Wells. After reading these two books, I'm very interested in the, these two foreigners. And I was very impressed by uh, Nimo Wells' book. He falls in love with Nimo Wells' writing and is especially delighted by her famous escape from her own hotel room, fooling the guards in order to make her way to Yan'an to talk to Mel. And uh, very deeply impressed by her adventures. And we have to get rid of, of those secret agents watching her day and night, jumping out of the hotel window in the middle of the night. <laughs> he is so impressed by this mysterious American woman. She was very, very courageous. Uh, and I think her story is even more interesting than most of the movies of adventure. So when Helen arrives in China in 1978, this time with a small film crew in tow to document her years of work in the 30s as a journalist and a writer. The government reaches out to An Wei. Hey, you speak English, right? And you worked at that museum in Yan'an on the Foster's Papers for a while, right? You probably know stuff about Yan'an and about the snows that might come in useful. You want to be your translator? So excited. And he puts all of that background knowledge to work immediately. I first so match with Hannah Snow and I talk with her and her group about the schedule. And I tell, well, you, you have to revisit the sitting guest house where you stay and you escaped in the middle of the night. She was such a surprise. How could you know that? I said, I read your book. Really? You are so young. Helen was charmed and delighted by this earnest young man who had been assigned as her minder and seemed so interested in the work she had done 40 years earlier. And by the end of this short trip, Helen Foster Snow and Anwe had struck up a friendship that would last the rest of her life. She kept writing to me, and I still remember in December 1978, I received her first letter with the article about her visit to Bao'an. I was impressed by her letter as well as her article. I think it is very beautifully written and I tried to translate it into Chinese. And I sent it to Literature Magazine. So it was published in October that year. And she told me that your translation is very good. Your translation is not only truthful to my original one, but also my humor in the article is very well expressed. And that is usually not easy to do, but you did a good job. After that, she keep on writing to me and sent her manuscripts one after another. And ask me, please, you, you try. Encourage me to translate and publish her books. She's blackballed. She cannot get anything published in America for decades. So the American public could not hear the different reports of objectivity. So that's the problem. That's, that's really not good. And yet, she is constantly writing. She writes dozens of books, knowing they won't go anywhere. No one will touch them. Her books could not be published in the United States. 
but she was not discouraged. She told me many times, I'm writing not for publishers. I finally put them together and make a list. It's about 64 manuscripts. And I find that so intriguing and impressive and baffling as someone who... Yeah, she must just have to write to write. Yes, I I like having written, Mm -hmm. but the process of writing is pretty painful for me a lot of the time. But I think she understands how important this information is going to be and that at some point, someone will figure out that this McCarthy nonsense is nonsense and come back for this. And that is what happens. Between 1985 and 86, I was invited to the United States as a scholar in residence in Trinity College. And I stayed there for one year. And I visited her at her home nearly every weekend to work together with her, listen to her, telling her experience in China, and uh, record uh, most of the interesting and important stories she told me. The year is very important, and I, I realized that she was a great woman. I came to the conclusion that her contribution to world peace is even greater. Her contribution is important. <laughs> and he becomes the translator for her work in Chinese. And she trusts him to translate her words in a way that stays true to what she's doing. (laughs) After this year of working with Helen in Connecticut, almost weekly, learning all about her life and her and Edgar's work direct from the source, Anwei knew he had to do something. When he returns to China at the end of the year, Anwei creates this museum exhibit on Helen and her work. She encouraged me to translate and publish her books. I said, well, that is important, but I want to run an exhibition in Xi'an. And that is the you know, very famous tourist city in our museum. When your book is published, it is only 10,000 copies. But if I run an exhibition, it will be seen by thousands upon thousands of people every day. So she said, well, it sounds reasonable. <laughs> and she's very generous and very pleased to offer me a lot of things. The fountain pen and the notebook she used when she interviewed Mao Zedong. She also let me have her small typewriter, which she used when when she was traveling. Those things are very precious. And now they are all displayed in our museum. He also founds the Edgar and Helen Foster Snow Study Center in Xi'an. Wow. Xi'an as in Xi'an, like terracotta army. Xi'an terracotta warriors. Yes. Cool. Um, Ancient capital of China. And that is where Professor Anwei lives. He started the center because he was determined to bring Helen back to the fame and respect that he felt she deserved in China and around the world. So after many years of our hard work, the government realized the importance of Hannah Snow and that she's a great woman who have been forgotten for such a long time. So the Chinese Writers Association offered the first very special literary prize called the International Literary Prize of Friendship and Understanding. This is a very long day. (laughs) Hamilton was the first receiver of this. So everybody is very happy. And Helen Snow is actually now in China even more famous than Edgar Snow. In 1996, China named Helen Foster Snow a friendship ambassador, which is the highest honor that the Chinese government can bestow on a foreigner. Helen is the first American 
ever honored wow. with this award. We'd heard the stories and all that, but none of us really knew the magnitude of it. I read her book, My China Years. I was in college, and I remember reading through this book. And I just thought, this reads like a movie. It had romance. It had adventure. It had political intrigue. It was a thriller. I mean, it had everything. But it really hit me when the Chinese people and like universities and the government, they were reaching out to our family to honor her. And that's when it started sinking in. I was living in Chicago at the time, and I got a, a call saying that my dad was going to China. And I was like, well, why is he going to China? Like, he doesn't even leave Utah. Like, what's he doing? You know? <laughs> and they're like, oh, it's for Helen. And, and so they invite him over there. He has dinner at the mayor of Beijing's house. And they roll out the red carpet. There's camera crews and video cameras. And that's when it, things just really started getting crazy. I went to a symposium and Kelly Long, who wrote Helen's biography, is giving this speech. And I remember this giant picture of Helen on the screen. And she's looking at me, and I'm looking back at her. It was as if she was talking to me. Adam, what are you going to do about this? And I was like, do what? What are you talking about? What am I going to do about what? You know? And for the next couple of years, I was just, what, are you, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> And so I started the Helen Foster Snow Foundation in 2018. And what's amazing about this, when you learn about your history, you never know where it's going to take you. A month ago, I found myself shaking hands with President Xi of China. Just as one does. <laughs> yes. You know, he, I was there as one of the international friends to honor Helen and got to participate in this big photo with him and all of China's international friends. The ambassador of China came to my house for Thanksgiving dinner. We taught him and his wife and 12 members of the embassy how to play pickleball. <laughs> so we, we had a, a nice little pickleball diplomacy moment. Uh, and it was, it was a great time. And it just showed me what Helena showed me. You know, you don't have to be the same ideology, the same political views, same culture, same country, the same anything, not even the same language. And you can still find ways to understand other people. Mm -hmm. And that's the lesson that I that teach my children. And I hope to our foundation, we can continue. And so our foundation has tried to continue that legacy and promote it. This last summer, we put on a big competition for STEM and for inventions for kids called Invention Convention China. We had over 20,000 participants in China, and we had ambassadors from 10 different countries that were there continuing this legacy that she built so many years ago. When she died in 1997, there was a memorial held for her in China's Great Hall of the People. This is... Wow. Uh, I mean, that that is... Astounding. Huge. That has happened a handful of times for a foreigner. Wow. They held a funeral for her yeah. in, essentially, Congress. For an American woman. Wow. Her gravestone is my favorite. After her death, Cheryl Foster Bischoff and I, we discuss about what we should club on her tombstone. We put two phrases. It has two epitaphs, Bridging Future Generations and Gung Ho Original, <laughs> which is huh, so perfect because she founded this incredibly important, wonderful, influential movement, and she absolutely was gung ho about yeah. everything she did. Her movement sort of coined that phrase, and she embodied it. Cool. Well, she inspires me to be more gung ho. I adore her. That open-mindedness and willingness to listen, to see people, mm. who they are and where they are. And I just mm. I have so much respect for her. And it annoys me a lot that nobody knows who she is here. 
There is a statue of her in Cedar City. Oh, which that's surprising. Was gifted to Cedar City by China. Oh, uh, <laughs> is her book still around? Can I read it? It is around. It is hard to get copies of most of her works. Shoot, you can find them used, and I highly recommend it. It is a fascinating look into a very, very confusing time, and the clarity that she brings to things. The, the the way she is able to, even in hindsight now, get to the heart of it hmm. and to see people for who they were instead of who they were supposed to be mm. or who her upbringing or her country had told her mm. these people were. But you can read more about her on the Utah Women's History Initiative website. There is an amazing documentary that was done about her a couple of years ago, Helen Foster Snow Witness to Revolution, which I highly recommend. Or there is a wonderful biography of her written by Professor Kellyanne Long. And the tide is turning, thanks in part, to the Helen Foster Snow Foundation and the Edgar and Helen Foster Snow Center in China because there is a scholarship program which every year sends a college student from China to Southern Utah University in Cedar City. Ah, perfect. It is a national computation, and all the college and the university students have the right to participate in it. And we always send the winner in this competition to SUU for one school year. And they use this uh, opportunity to learn about such a great person. To learn about Helen Foster Snow, but more importantly, to teach about Helen Foster Snow. To come to America and teach Americans oh. about Helen Foster Snow, which is such a wonderfully loopy, yeah. full circle That's great. event that she made her name by explaining China to the West and then by explaining China to China <laughs> as a Westerner. And now there are Chinese students coming to the West to, to explain, explain the translator of her. China to the West from China. That's awesome. Helen Snow played a very important role as a bridge between different cultures, between different uh, social systems, between the rich and the poor. So through these kind of things, it's, uh, the young people between China and the United States come friendly to each other and learn each other's culture through the Helen Snow Bridge. Isn't that beautiful? It's such a credit to her methodology that you just need people to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And you need to tell people how they are the same. Mm -hmm. It's hard to summarize a person's life, but she made a difference in so many ways. It's this legacy that just continues. Yeah. I'm proud to be a foster. Huge, huge thanks to Professor An Wei and Adam Foster. Visit our website at whatshernamepodcast.com to find photos, links, resources, and more. Especially links to Helen Foster Snow's books, the documentary, and the biography of An Wei. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on whatever platform you listen to us on. It really does make a huge difference in helping us find new listeners. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson. And this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle.